what are you doing with that ladle? What are you doing with that ladle? Mm -hmm. No, you don't. I know, I know you're, I, it ain't happening. You just have to bring it back with you. I know what you're doing. We'll talk about this later. <laughs> Julie. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> so this is what's good about, a, you guys have no idea what we're talking about, do you? But, but, but we get to know each other. We're, we're family. And that's the, that's the wonderful thing about church. That's why Jesus said, you know, he's the head of the church. He wants us to be the church. And because we become family. You know, and that's the whole thing is, is to get knit in with each other, to share in each other's lives, to share in the joys, to share in the hardships, you know, and, and, uh, and so we, we love it when you're here and we miss you when you're gone. I guess so. Anyway, let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for this morning. I am so grateful to be here, Lord, to uh, get to just share uh, in the, the calling that you Put upon each and every one of us, Lord, in our lives. And so, uh, Lord, we desire nothing but to glorify you. Uh, Lord Jesus, to lay our lives before you. And, uh, that you might truly be Lord over us. And so, Lord, I pray for your spirit upon us, God. That uh, you would just motivate our hearts and our minds to, to just draw near and nearer unto you. Each and every moment of the day, I pray, God, that you would just, Lord, be blessed glorified in your precious name we pray and the church said amen amen so you're welcome to stand or sit as you feel led this morning so there is none like you can touch my heart like you do I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you
Seems like and all I can see was the scroll. I'm haunted by ghosts that lived in my past. I'm bound up in shackles of all my. How long is this going to last? Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am.
have a lot of songs. Worship takes many different forms, wouldn't you agree? So like that's not really a worship song, but it is a testimonial song. You know, and, and often Paul used testimonies of what God did with the nation of Israel and what God did in his life to reach those who were lost, those who were unbelieving. You know, the greatest thing we have is the work that God did in our lives. And so these testimonial songs, a lot of people, they, they come to church and they say, well, I just don't like that worship. That doesn't glorify God. Well, I disagree. I disagree because I think the greatest story we have is our story. And so we got guys like Big Daddy Weave. That was a Big Daddy Weave song. We say, yeah, I, I, went, I sang a Big Daddy Weave song today because his story is an amazing story. I have been redeemed. All those sins that plagued me, I've shaken off all those chains. I no longer have to bear those with me. I no longer drag those around with me. I've been redeemed. That should be all of our story, shouldn't it not?
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Uh-huh. <laughs> so who'd, who'd like to pay for our offering today? Uh, it, okay. It's <laughs> Well-oiled machine. Good morning, Norm. Good morning. How are you? How was Cancun? Uh, awesome. There's only one after it. Oh, it was terrible. The weather was perfect. The water was warm. The food was, you know, just. We missed you guys. We're glad you're back. Thanks, Jay. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my reading this morning is from Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Uh, at this time, Paul was in prison, suffering br from brutal treatment, but he was still able to write letters of encouragement to his people. In 19, he starts, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father God, thank you for this reminder from your word. And I just pray that we can carry it with us every day of our lives and, and spread that faith and, and that, uh, um, I don't know, just the uh, encouragement that he gives us to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Give them. 
love all those old songs, right? Yeah. yeah. They're timeless. I'm going to fly through these announcements. Right. So, oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Unruly thing. All right. So, first of all, we're going to say um, welcome. We're glad you're here. We're going to have our church family Thanksgiving potluck this evening at 5.30. So how do we want to set up tables? Do we want to set them up right after church? She says yes. So if you want to serve just faithfully, stick around. and <laughs> you can Move all these chairs, set up every table we've got, and, and, uh, and then we'll join back here. You know, try to show up about 5 o'clock or stuff and get things set up, get the crock pots plugged in. And, and then we'll have our... And it, who's invited somebody? All right. Who's going to drag somebody? <laughs> All right. So, you know, the, yeah, who's being dragged? You know, the idea is, is, is uh, yeah, fellowship and gathering of the church, but, but it's also to, to invite our friends and family to come and, and see the life that we live here. Shine a light. You know, and so in a very non-confrontation, we're not going to you know, put the screws to them that, you know, come to Jesus or, no, that's not the point. We're just, we just want to love up on everybody. And, and so please uh, invite your friends and family and come. Uh, no service this Wednesday. Allow us some travel time if you're going to go visit friends and family for Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, November 28th, November 25th. Fifth. Oh, jumping back a little bit. November 25th through December 5th. So, who's heard of KCAP? Okay. Kane County Assistance Program. There was a, a, a gal in this church, and she saw a need in the community, and she came to me, and she said, we need to start a assistance program for the people that live in Kane County because there is no place for them to go when they need help. And so we started Kane County KCAP, Kane County Assistance Program. Well, there's a, the volunteer group has, it's called Polar Express. They took an old bus, they converted it into the Polar Express train, and they do a fundraiser, and they pick a, what would I call it, a program to, to serve. And so they chose KCAP this year. KCAP is totally self-funded. It's totally by volunteers. We don't go out. We don't do fundraisers. We don't ask for money. We pray to God, and, and God just provides. And, and, and so if you'd like to be part of that, they just need people to, to take tickets, take money and take It's like five bucks, I think, to ride the Polar Express. So November 25th to December 5th, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Um, it's like a three-hour block, but they said, if you want to just come serve for an hour, okay, they'll take whatever they can get. And, and so there's sign-up sheets. If you'd like to just serve our community in a very easy way, you take people's money, you hand them a ticket. And it's generally kids. So please, please, they, they, they need some help. So um, if you can sign up for that, please do. Uh, let's see, Monday, December 2nd, 6 to 7.30 p.m., the Ladies' Holiday Craft Night. That's going to be headed up by Charlotte Young. There's a sign-up sheet out there, and so there's Charlotte right there. Her phone number um, costs $10, and uh, just another time of fellowship and gathering together for you ladies. So uh, Saturday, December 7th, men's breakfast. This is our final one of the year, and then we're going to kind of take a season off, and so we'll finish up our, our men's breakfast. Anybody want to cook for that? <laughs> Looks like it's McDonald's. Rocky's going to cook. All right, fantastic. Rocky always does a great job. And so uh, then December 14th is 
At 9.30 a.m. is the ladies' Christmas social. And then right after that is the tamalata party. <laughs> For all you folks that want to learn how to make tamales. I'm like, what is a tamalata party? What are you ladies up to? So the church is providing the masa and the corn husks, and you bring your own filling. So I was telling April, I, I tried pineapple and jalapenos. It was awesome. I'm like, that was, anyway, so, uh, and this is for anybody. So guys, want to come and help make some tamales? I think we're going to get enough to make what? Okay, 700 dozen. That's just for Rocky stash. All right. Let me pray. and then, we'll, Father, I just pray over each and every one of these events, Lord. We, we, we gather together to fellowship, but Lord, to bring glory to you. Lord, we are children of God by faith in Christ and, and the work that you've done for us and and so let each and every one of these events be an outreach to the community, to those who are walking in darkness, God, that they might uh, come and, and, and see the light and partake of the goodness of our God. Lord, may you uh, just, uh, we pray that you would bless all these, Lord, for your sake, for your praise, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's uh, open up our Bibles to Romans, and we'll continue our study through God's Word. Um, you know, in the, in the previous chapter, we're just going to kind of jump right in. in. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul wrote this. He said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God is revealed. It is manifested to us from heaven against ungodliness our sins against God, and our unrighteousness, our unrighteous acts against one another, the wrath of God. The reason Paul's writing this letter isn't to condemn us. We need to get that out of the way, first and foremost. It's not to condemn us, but it's to show us our need for a Savior because we are condemned by our very nature. And we looked at that. In, in chapter 1, you know, we looked at Basically, the immoral man, the man that practices sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters. Ooh. Any of you guys boasters? Man, I can do that in... Careful, careful. The wrath of God will be poured out against boasters and the proud you know we want to pick out we want to pick out the the worst sins the the sexual immorality the 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 violence the murderers the haters the the liars the thieves the cheats enviers gossipers whispers I, i'm i'm included in there i can't escape it you ever envied? You ever coveted someone else's belongings? Or the wrath of God is poured out against all of that stuff, all of it. The immoral man is condemned before God, and we would all say, "Amen, brother." I know they are sinners, every one of them. Sinners, every one. Yes, the wrath of God is condemned them, them people, the, the immoral, absolutely. Okay, hold your horses. Let's go to chapter 2. Now, I'm going to show you. In chapter 2, we're going to talk about the moral man, where he stands before God. We'll talk about the religious and the unreligious, or the irreligious. I don't know what's the word. The, the guy that doesn't practice any religion. We'll talk about the legalist man, the man that follows the law of God. We'll see where he stands with God. We'll follow maybe the, the ritualistic man that loves the, the religious rituals. 
Let's see where he stands before God as well. Paul is going to talk about all of these. And, and we'll just see. We'll just see if, if, we're, if we hold any water as well. So in chapter 1, we know that the immoral man was found guilty before the righteousness of God. Chapter 2. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. So now Paul turns around. He's talking to the sinful people of the world, showing them of their, their unrighteousness. But now he turns around and he says, Now you, he's pointing to the church, you, O man, you are inexcusable. Whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God according to, is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Therefore, you... You are inexcusable because you do the same things. Wait a minute. I do not. I don't practice those things. Who are you to, who are you to accuse me of being sinful like that immoral man? Right? Come on, I'm not alone in this. I know there's a few others out there that think that. No, no, that ain't me. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a thief. I'm not a liar. I don't cheat on my taxes. Oh, really? Okay. You remember in, in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus gave the, 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 the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and then he, he, he says, hey, let, let me just tell you, we, while we're talking about the law here, let's, let's get to the heart of the matter. Because the law isn't about really your actions. It's about your heart. It's about your mind. He says, have you ever hated somebody? I mean, you just uh, hate that person. Hate even seeing them in the market. He says, that thought is murder. He says, you might as well be guilty of murder. Do you guys hate those terrorists? I'm, I'm just speaking from my own heart. Do you hate those people that prey upon children and women? Do you hate them? Those immoral people that practice such things? Uh, I know in my mind what, what I would do. Jesus says, if that's my thought, if that's my heart, I am a murderer in God's eyes. It doesn't matter if they're guilty of that sin or not. That isn't the point. God is the only righteous one. His righteousness is what we're looking at, not mine. So I have no right to judge that immoral man. Have you ever lusted after a woman, gentlemen? If it wasn't your wife, Jesus says you've committed adultery in your heart. Now, so we're talking about the physical things, the physical acts, you know? That's, we, that's where we like to go. See, I didn't actually, I didn't do that. I've never slept with that other woman. I never... I never stuck that man with a knife. I didn't do that. Jesus says, well, anyone, it's not your actions that I'm so concerned about. It's the motivation of your heart and your mind that we're talking about. And, and Jesus went on in Matthew chapter 7. He says, judge not that you be not judged, right? Or condemn not. Don't judge with condemnation. We are to discern righteously. Let's get that out of the way. We are. We're called to do that. We have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in our lives and our hearts. We are called to judge righteously, discerning specific things. But he's talking about here judging with condemnation. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use it, it will be measured out to you. If there's no mercy or, or, or compassion in your judgment, don't expect any from God when you stand before his throne. And when you walk down the street in your, in your morality, in your goodness, and you come upon those, those people, ah, they're so sinful, God, with their addictions and their bad behavior, and they're just getting their just rewards. They deserve it. 
God says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, Mr. Moral Man. With that thought life, you have just condemned yourself. Because that's how God saw you before you were saved. We'll get into that a little later. That's the depravity God saw in you. And did he look at you that way and condemn you? No, he saw you for who you were, but, but, but he desires to see you for more than that. You see, when, because the judgment of God is according to truth. God's truth, not yours and mine. God's truth is pure. It's untainted. It's not moved by emotions or past events. It's pure and it's true, and it stands alone by itself. It is truth. And so God judges by that, and he doesn't fudge us. And, and so we have to be careful in all this. You remember the story of, of the, Jesus told the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican or the tax collector that both were going up to the temple, you remember, to give their offerings and to pray? Do you remember the story? And when they got there, they both bowed down, and, and, and the Pharisee looked over at this guy and went, Oh, Lord, thank you that I am not like this man. Thank you that I pay all my tithings. Thank you that I go to church on Sunday. Thank you that I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the life that I live that has spread such light into the world and that I am not like this man who is so dark and sinful. Thank you, God. Thank you. You know, Jesus says that he prayed thus to himself. As this man was praying, God's like, I ain't listening to any of that. He's praying to himself. But then this man, who was on his knees, says he beat his chest and he says, forgive me, God. Oh, I am a sinner. I know it. And he says, I don't have, I don't have the right to ask you anything. I know who I am. And I'm sure he's going, and, and, and God, I wish I could be more like him. But she says as they left, it said, God said that this, this poor man here was justified more than this man, the moral man. The, the immoral man was more justified in his sin than the moral man was found in his morality. That's the point Paul's making here. Be careful. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at this just a couple weeks ago. Colton brought this up, and I saw this for the first time, and it kind of just, it, it was like God grabbed me and just shook me. Wake up. Listen to, he says, as, let's just go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, verses 14 and 16. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 16. It says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should, know, should live no longer for themselves. He's talking to us, right? He says, but for him who died for them and rose again. So we no longer live to ourselves, but we live to Jesus. Because the love of God compels us to live for Jesus. And to deny ourselves and follow after him. Yes, we would agree to that. Okay. So he says, okay. Therefore, because of that, that, that compelling heart to live for the Lord, he says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. You see, as we go through life as Christians, as born-again believers, the Spirit of God dwelling and living in our hearts and minds, when we look at each other, we're not supposed to look at, at, at these unbelievers, these sinful people. You know what we're to see when we see them? What they could be in Christ. Not who they are in the flesh. Because if we see them for who they are in the flesh, they're just sinful, condemned people. 
and the wrath of God is, is abiding upon them. But we're not to look at them that way. We're to look at them and see who they could be in Christ. And thank God I know that you guys look at me that way, right? You look at me, it's, oh man, what he could be in Jesus. What our pastor could be when, if he would just walk with the Lord a little more each and every day. I, I, thank you. Please do look at me that way. Because that's the way I want to look at you guys too. And, 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 and I want to encourage us to, to walk in the light as he is in the light. But you see, if we put on our morality, that can hinder that, can it not? Verses 4 through 8, it says, For do you despise the riches of his goodness, the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day, or in the day of wrath and revelation uh, to the righteous judgment of God. He says, You, O moral man, as you walk around in your self righteous morality, condemning the immoral sinners of this world, you yourself are storing up wrath against your own self. It's like you've built a dam and you're just flooding the waters in, but it's an earthen dam and it's got some fissures in it. And you're just pouring the water in behind it. Eventually the dam's going to break and the wrath is going to be poured out upon you. O oh, moral man. He says, because you, what you've done is, is you've, you're living this life thinking that you're pure and clean when you're really an adulterer and a thief. In your heart, you may not be doing it out here in the open, but in your heart it's there. And he says, you're just as guilty as the immoral man. <coughs> and what you've done, <coughs> excuse me, is that you've mistaken the long-suffering, the forbearance, the goodness of God for tolerance of your sin. You think because God hasn't judged you that the wrath of God isn't pouring out on you that <clears throat> God is okay with your sin. You mistake it. You see, because it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. It, it, I know in my life that is absolutely true. It's because God did not judge me. He kept bearing with me through years and years of sexual immorality and drug addiction and anger. And he waited and waited and waited until I was so broken. And then he reached down and said, have you had enough? Let me help you up. You know, I've got a better life for you, son. Let me dust you off here a little bit. Stand up. We can get through this. I'll help you. But I had to humble myself before God. And then I had to, had to do something else that he asked me to do. Repent. Quit doing that. Please. You're breaking my heart. I've watched you do this for 30 years of your life, son, and you're breaking my heart. Repent. Quit doing it. Turn from it. I'll help you. And the goodness of God saved me. The goodness of God. He wasn't beating me with a stick. Every time. That was my mom and dad. <laughs> <coughs> Thank God for disciplining parents. Thank you, Lord. I did need a whooping a time or two. But that never brought me to righteousness, never brought me to salvation. But the goodness of God does. But the moral man sees it as something bad. That God should be, the wrath of God should be poured out upon you. You're reaping what you've sown. You deserve it. Ouch. God says, nope. You're storing up wrath upon yourself when you have that kind of attitude, oh moral man. He says for, <clears throat> verse 6, for God will render to each one according to his deeds. That is not a good thing. A lot of people say, oh, that's a good thing. I, I'm a good person. No, you're not. That's a bad thing. You see, God says in all your morality, I'm going to judge you according to it. 
I'm going to give you exactly what you doled out. And he says, and he goes on, he says, for eternal life to those who by patient, continuous in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Yes. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. <clears throat> but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. God says, all right, let me just boil it all down for you. There's a lot of words in there, but I'm, I'm a simple guy. Your immorality will not find you no righteousness with God. Your morality will not find you any righteousness with God. God is impartial. He judges by truth. And if there's any darkness in your hearts, your morality will find you no righteousness with God. And by the way, you should do good. You're called to do good. You're created in the image of God, and God is good. You should, should do good. God owes you nothing for it. <clears throat> do we not expect that from our children as well? Do you only feed them if they take out the garbage? You didn't take out the garbage. No dinner for you tonight. No. But we expect you to take out the garbage. Do we not? Rake the yard. Mow the yard. Help your mom and dad out a little bit. Do your chores. Do well in school. Be nice to people. Do good. But I owe you nothing for that. I expect it from you. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the, the immoral man, convicted, unrighteous before God. The moral man, does he have a leg to stand on? Not much of one. Let's talk about the religious man and the irreligious man. Let's see, let's see where they, their righteousness with God is. <clears throat> he says, for as many have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. And we say, amen, that's right. That's right. But as as many have as sinned in the law, will be judged by the law. I don't know an opposite word for amen. <laughs> Here's the deal. God, because he's not partial to anybody, he's not partial to anybody. He says, there are those who sinned outside the law and they will perish. But as many who have the law, or they got their Bible, and they don't follow it, they'll perish as well. That's fair, isn't it? That's fair. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. <clears throat> Just because I have this Bible, and I've had it for many years, and I've got it all highlighted, and I've got it marked, and I've... I've worn this thing out. I've got a whole roll of scotch tape in here. And, and I've got all these notes. And, and this thing sits on my lap two or three times a week. And, and I can't walk in and say, God, look at my Bible. Look at me. And he's like, yeah, look at you. I gave you that thing. You've had it for 40 years of your life. You've read it I don't know how many times. And you never did any of it. <laughs> Teachers. We give our kids these, these, these books, and, and if they don't read it and don't do what's in it, are you going to give them a passing grade? Only get rid of them, just to get them. <laughs> He's been here four years. Ugh. No, you don't get a passing grade. You fail. And that's what God's saying. Just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to get through. You have to do hearers and doers of the word. I'm convicted by this because there's a lot of things in here in the Bible. I read it and I'm like, I don't do that. I know I don't do that. Hearers or doers, not only hearers only. And then he goes on in verses 14 and 15. So now we have this old, what about those pygmies in, in Africa or wherever pygmy? I don't know, where do pygmies live? What about these people that, that never had, never went to church, never talked to a missionary? 
in their entire life. Do you know that it's absolutely true that there are people in this world today that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? They have never held a Bible in their hand in their own language that they could read. They're out there. I've met them. There's millions of them. There's probably billions of them. So this is, this is for them. It says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Okay? God says, I gave them a conscience. I gave you a conscience, and I gave them a conscience. They've never read the laws of God, but they are now a law unto themselves. Okay? He says, and, and they th who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, here's the deal. God is righteous and God is just. Amen? We agree that. God's righteousness is right. God's justice is just for everyone. There is no partiality. So what about the guy that never heard the gospel? Well, God says, they don't get a free pass either. I gave them a conscience from birth as Guy grew up. If his mother never shared anything with him, Guy grew up knowing right from wrong. I've seen it in my kids. I didn't have to teach my kids to steal. I didn't have to teach them to lie. They did it on their own. They did it very well. My daughter's standing there with a cookie all over her face, and she said, I didn't take the cookie. It was Dylan. <laughs> and Dylan's three. He's like, what? What's going on? Not only did she steal and lie, but she bore false witness against her brother and desired for him to get the whooping. And she would have loved it. She, would have, she wouldn't have said a word if I'd have whooped Dylan. I didn't teach her to do that. She knew. And you know what else? When I pull out the camera and we got a picture of her stealing the cookies, she knew she was guilty. You know, what I'm amazed at, too, is you know that God put a conscience in animals, at least my dogs. <laughs> I'm telling you. I come in the other day, and little Missy's looking around the corner on the countertop <laughs> as I come in the door, and she's like, ears automatically went, oh. <laughs> and, and then she comes crawling across the floor, dragging her legs like she's paralyzed. Don't beat me. We have a conscience. And you will not escape because God says your conscience will either accuse you or excuse you. And so you got to ask the question, have you ever broke or disobeyed your own conscience about something? Have you betrayed yourself? Were you not condemned in that? You see, God says, we're not, I'm not going to, I judge according to truth, and I am just. So I'm not going to just blanketly condemn people simply because they never heard the gospel. No, no, no. He says, I gave you something that will either testify against you or not. And let me ask you, is there anybody here that has a pure conscience? No. Not a single one of us. You see, the religious man is condemned by the law because he can read it and he knows he's broken the law. And the irreligious man knows that he's condemned as well because his conscience bears witness against himself. God says that's fair. That's fair. So now we see the immoral man is, finds no righteousness before God in his immorality. The moralistic man finds no righteousness with God because of his morality. 
The irreligious man finds no righteousness with God because of his... And neither does the religious man. We'll go on to him next. He's, you see, because the secrets of men, what's in your heart, is what God will judge. And he will judge it by Jesus Christ. Not by your standards, but by Jesus's. Is that not fair? Jesus came and said, I'll set the example. I'll live a pure and sinless life so that we will know where the standard falls. You don't get to set the standard. Your righteousness, your morality, no, no, no. Because we're all over the map. It's like I was telling everybody on Wednesday. Mine is here. My little eight-inch dog can jump over my bar of righteousness. Everybody gets in. Everybody. Because I know myself. But there's a lot of Christians, and they've set the bar here. And the thing is, they've set it so high that they can't even get over it themselves. They don't even realize it. They've condemned themselves. And so he goes on. He says, in, indeed, you are called a Jew, and you rest on the law, and you make your boast in God. I go to church every Sunday. Man, my Bible is just, I've wore out four of these things. And I, I've been baptized. I've been confirmed or whatever. I've, I've done it all. I've got the certificates, and I make my boast in God. And I know his will, and I approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. And I would say, amen. I, yes, I agree, Lord. I agree. He says, and you are confident that, yourself, that, that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. And they look at me and they say, Amen, Pastor, that's you. Wait a minute. How many of you guys are holding the Bible today? Come on, raise them up. Guess what? That's you too. You are an instructor of the law as well. You have the instruction book. You have the answers to the test. Every single one of you. So it's not just pastors. It's not just... It's all of us. And he says, and you say you do not commit adultery. Oh, excuse me. I jumped one. Uh, he says, you therefore, you teach another. Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal. Do you steal? And you say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? And, a, and you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You make your boast in the law, but do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. So actually here we have, we could call this guy the legalistic man. He's got the law of God. I've got it down. I know everything I should do. And man, I'm going to tell everybody else that they need to be doing it too. The legalistic man. He says, do you teach a man not to steal and yet you steal? Teach a man not to commit adultery, but you commit adultery? And you're like, I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. Well, we've kind of been through this already, right? Do you steal and commit adultery? You see, let's, God's talking about in the spiritual sense. In, in Malachi chapter 3, God talks about stealing. He says, and they said, when have we ever robbed God? When have we ever robbed you, Lord? When have we ever stole from you? And he says, when you withhold your tithings from my church, you steal from me. Whoa. He's like, oh, you're just trying to fill the coffers, pastor. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not what God's talking about here. What he's talking about is, is you had opportunity. I've given you opportunity after, I've blessed you. You've, you've lived a good life. You made a good living. You had opportunity upon opportunity to help and you chose not to. He says, you've robbed from me when you did that. You left my storehouses empty. We would have helped the poor. You robbed from me. You're a thief. You stole from me. Because God says, and we know as Christians, everything that we have is because God has given it to us. We understand that. Do we not? If you don't, you need to. 
by the grace of God that we have what we have, the lifestyle, this, this, this middle-class America that we get to live in is amazing, folks. We are rich. We are wealthy. You go to a third-world country, there is no middle class. You have the haves and the have-nots. We're the wannabes. <laughs> We're the middle class. We're blessed. We're rich. And we have opportunity time and time again to help and to bless. And, and, and so we're guilty. The, the, the legalistic man, he's guilty. And he says, you do not, did you not commit adultery? We automatically think of sleeping around. But that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about spiritual adultery. And he gave us examples time and time again. The nation of Israel, the Old, the Old Testament. If you read through it, it's just one example over another of how God was faithful to them and they were adulterous to God. They went sleeping around with pagan idols or they substituted a relationship with God for something else. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, when you do that, when you... Whatever it may be, maybe it's your stock market, maybe it's sports, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's hunting, maybe it's whatever it may be. You say, well, I'd, I'd rather spend time doing that than spending time with you, Lord. God says, you know what that is to me? Adultery. You're cheating around on me. And, and yes, and, and so even the legalistic man, is, he says, you're, you're condemned unto this too. And he says, because of it, you make your boast in the law, but you dishonor God. And he, and he says, you know what the byproduct of that is? You blaspheme the name of God among all the Gentiles, among all the unbelievers. They see that you should be going, spending time with the Lord, serving the Lord, serving God's people, and you aren't. And yet you call yourself a Christian. And they look at you, the unbelievers, those who are walking in darkness, look over that and say, I have one no part of your God. You're Jesus. We blaspheme the name of God because the label on the outside doesn't match the product that's on the inside. It says peas and carrots, but you know what's in here? Dog food. <laughs> and you open that up and you open the lid and you're sorely disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> tables like, oh, that's gross. <coughs> Yes, that's what he's talking about here. You put this label on the outside. You said, this is who I am. But when you open up the can, it's, it's not what's... And when, when that's revealed to a, a broken world out there, and they see that, what do you think it says? See, that was the problem with Israel way back in the day. They kept saying, we're children of God. The, the Most High God has blessed us, given us a promised land and all of this, but their life was yuck. And all the nations around them said, what have we to do with your God? Nothing. The legalistic man finds no righteousness before God either. We got one guy left. We got one more. Maybe our religious rituals will get us there. <laughs> maybe by doing things. Maybe that's the answer. Right? So, verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable. Okay, if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcised. And the ladies are going, whoa. Okay, we understand what circumcision was about, right? It was a sign for the nation of Israel. God chose these Hebrew people and said, you are going to be a special people to me. You are going to be a, a light to the world, and I'm going to set a mark upon you that everybody that sees you will know that you're mine. And it's, it's symbolic. And he says, you're going to be circumcised the eighth day. And it's a, it's a cutting away of the flesh. 
right? No longer are you a child of the flesh, but now you're a child of God. You walk according to the spirit. And so it's this symbolic, it's God's dealing with the flesh, right? That's what it was all about in, in a nutshell. But he says, but if you don't follow me, then your circumcision is of no profit. It, it will profit you nothing. It's of no avail. And he says, will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? That's that guy who does the will of God, even though he doesn't have the law. This Gentile. He says, will I not use him? who does what I asked him to do, will he not judge you? Yes, the answer is yes. And, and he says, why? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but is from God. Once again, God always says, I want to deal with your heart. If I deal with your heart, it'll come out in your flesh eventually. If I try to deal in your flesh to get through to your heart, I'm going to have to slice and dice you so many ways, you're not going to make it. It doesn't work from the outside in. It works from the inside out. You can baptize me a thousand times and say all kinds of words in every language you're, you can possibly think. Am I going to be any cleaner inside when you pull me out of that water? No. Baptism avails you nothing. Circumcision avails you nothing. Ritualistic behaviors and practices avail you no righteousness with God. <clears throat> we all want to look at the Catholics. So we want to look at, the, oh, look at their ritualistic behavior. Well, maybe so. What about you? Do you have little practices you do? Got my special go to holy church meeting socks I put on. Every time I put on my holy socks, I'm more holier than thou. Whatever it may be. Maybe you got, I got my special you know, necklace that I put on or, or my shirt that makes me look more righteous. We are weird. We do weird things. We do. Well, if I read my Bible seven and a half minutes every day, I can get through my Bible every year, and yeah, that'll do it. And then you miss it. And so now you're reading it for 15 minutes the next day. And, and, you got, and pretty soon you get into this ritual. And we do it. We do it. You don't know, we not only do it, the pagan world does it too. I hang this little jewel around my neck. And, you know, I set up my little... God says, no. No, 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 no. None of that avails anything with me. I'm after something much deeper in you. Do we, do, do we want praises from men that, that they see all your rituals and all of that and they go, oh yeah, look how religious that guy is. Or do we want the praise that comes from God that's only between you and him? Nobody else is going to hear that. You know, Paul talked about that. He's, he says, you know, the, the righteousness I want is the righteousness that comes from God. What Paul is, is trying to do is, is, this is an indictment against all of us. All of us. There's nobody, nobody can stand before God and declare himself righteous. Nobody. The immoral man can't, the moral man can't, the legalist can't, the religious can't, the irreligious. The, none of us. That's the point that Paul wants to make with us. It's abundantly clear. You know, you want to be a child of God? You want to be a Jew? That's what it is. When you say, I'm a I'm, the Jewish people, it's, they're children of God. 
You want to be a child of God? I'll tell you how. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. You were not born a child of God. I don't care how many television shows or, or philosophers tell you that. That is absolutely contrary to God's word. God's word says you were born a child of wrath by nature. You're a rebellious child. You have the right to become a child of God by receiving Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And, and then in Philippians chapter 3, Paul wrote, he says, you know, I'm going to paraphrase all this stuff. He says, I count all that religious stuff a loss. It was worthless. It was rubbish. It was garbage. I count it all loss for the knowledge and the excellency of Christ. Not having my own righteousness that is found in the law, but the righteousness which comes from God by faith. Boils it down. That's If you want righteousness with God, if you want to be right before God, it needs to come from Him. You can't do it yourself. That's, the, that's what Paul's trying to just... He, he, we're only through chapter 2 of the book of Romans. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord. <clears throat> the indictment needs to come out. The charges need to be laid out on the table now that we might find the answer to them later. If you're sitting here today and you say, I'm not a sinner. Paul says, let me lay it out before you. I think you are. I think you are guilty. I think the indictment is, I think it'll stick. <laughs> That's my friend David there. He's come to visit. My immoral behavior and my attitudes, creation speaks against me and condemns me. My moral behavior and my attitudes, my religious and unreligious behavior and attitudes, my own conscience convicts me. My legalistic behavior or my ritualistic behavior and attitudes, the law convicts me. There are none good, no, not one. Folks, we've got to raise our standards of goodness, not lower them. In our love for one another, we've lowered our standards of goodness so, so low that they're... And then we, we, we present that before God and say, accept my goodness, God, as the standard. Can God do that? Can God overlook our sinful behavior and still maintain his righteousness? That's the dilemma for God. I read a short little story about a, a boy that went and uh, broke out a bunch of windows in, in a, out of a bunch of cars. High dollar cars, by the way. They weren't these little Chevys. These were BMWs and Mercedes and all this. And, and uh, <clears throat> when he got to court, he stood there before the judge, and the judge says, um, it's going to be a $10,000 fine. And uh, you're going to need to pay it before you leave today, son, or else you go to jail. And the, and the boy looked at him and said, I can't pay that. And he says, besides, Dad, <laughs> how can you do this to me? I'm your son. And he looks at him and he says, I know, son, but I'm the judge. I'm the judge. And so I am your judge. And, and this is, is the penalty. And then the judge took off his robe, walked around, and came and stood beside his son and said, Your Honor, I will pay his fine in full today. He says, I'm your dad now. But when I'm up there, I'm the judge. But I'm your dad. You see, this is exactly what God did for us. God was sitting behind. He was the judge. 
And he looks at us and he says, you're guilty and this is the punishment. The wrath of God is your punishment. And then he took off his cloak and he came down to earth and he stands beside us and says, I'll pay your debt, son. Because you can't afford it. That's exactly what God did for us. And so if there's any of us out here today and you're, you're standing on whatever it may be for your righteousness before God, I would encourage you to let it go and seek the righteousness that is found from God through Jesus Christ. Would you not agree? You know, I'm not here to condemn you that you all walk out of here as Eeyores, but we walk out of here as Winnie the Poohs because we we found the jar of honey. And and it's it's in Jesus Christ. He's paid your debt for you because he loves you so desperately. He does not desire that you would fa face the wrath of God. But we need to let go of whatever it is that we're standing on if it isn't Jesus. If we're not standing on the rock, I just encourage you to let it go. So the worship team come up. We have one more song and, and then... Uh, pray for us real quick and then we'll uh, this father we just lord I, I just stand here for myself uh, lord realizing um, lord i'm convicted on so many areas of my life even today lord i, I understand that that uh, maybe lord i've come before you um in in my self-righteousness or my moralistic attitudes and, and said well lord look at me I, um, i'm not doing any of that stuff anymore but God, I know the truth is that I, I have sinned against you. I have fallen short of the glory of my creator. I have been ungodly towards you. I have been unrighteous towards my fellow man. And Lord, I do stand indicted and convicted today. But Lord, I, I also know that by just simple faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, that you will cleanse me from all unrighteousness, all ungodliness that I can stand before you justified, whole and pure before you, Lord, not having any condemnation by simply receiving the gift of God through Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord I don't want to stand on my morality. I don't want to stand on my consciousness. I don't want to stand on religion. Lord, I don't want to stand upon anything other than uh, faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And so, Lord, I just pray if there's anybody out here that need to make that confession today, Lord, that we trust in you and you alone, Lord, and that you will, you're faithful in your promise to clean us of all sin. Lord, that we might stand before a pure and righteous God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you like to stand up?
Would you come and close us out, please? <coughs> okay. <laughs> Just get it out. Just get it out. That wasn't for me, was it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. No, it's for the Lord. For Father God, we come here today to hear your word, to learn from your word, and to praise you for your word. And I pray that we can remember to every day of our lives to praise you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So anybody want to stick around and move some chairs? Just a little bit. No. Is everyone going? <laughs> Please do that. And then we'll see you back here around 5. Mm -hmm. 5.15.